Amen. Aren't you glad you know him today? God bless you. You can be seated. It's great to be in the house of the Lord again. Good to have all of you here. We still got some that are sick, some that are out of town. We're glad that you're here. Uh, good to have Brother and Sister Rhodes here from Piqua. They're from our home church. Amen. We're glad they're here. It's a lot of things to do in East Tennessee. They made a sacrifice to come here today. We're delighted to have them. This is going to be my last chance to talk to you for a couple of services. Um, I have, um, I've got a conference to preach, and I'm going to be uh, gone for a couple of days. My wife will still be here. Um, I... I may be here Wednesday night, but if I am, I'm not going to be preaching Wednesday night. Um, I've got to do five services in four days, and I'm too old for that. <laughs> Anybody got any pills you take for that? <laughs> I'm tired thinking about it. I, I've studied the last few days, all day, and today, um, last night I was getting ready for this service, and um, outside of the time it took to mow the yard, I studied till almost one o'clock, got up this morning, still wasn't finished, It's the reason I missed the Bible lesson today, I still feel like I'm not ready, but I'm going to give it the best shot that I can. I'm going to go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. The, these are familiar scriptures. We've, we've preached from these before, but maybe you'll hear this from a different point of view today. In Zechariah 12 and 2, the Bible said, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. That word trembling there, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling, that word is actually poison. It'll be a cup of poison unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it, shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. I'm going to take my time today. I've got a lot I need to cover. But I want to entitle this, The Battle for Jerusalem. The Battle for Jerusalem. We can read today, and I, if I had more time, I would portions from Ezekiel chapters 38 and chapter 39. We could talk about the first Gog-Magog war where the Bible said that God drew them, drew the nations to Israel. He, he drew them there to be against his people at the beginning of the great tribulation and he would destroy them there. He would let the world know that he was God. The unbelievers, the, the atheists, they would know that there is a God in Israel. From that, I don't have time to get into that, but from that would come a peace treaty that the Antichrist is going to somehow manage, manipulate. I will tell you that the Jews in Israel, the rabbis in Israel, even the Jerusalem Post records editorials from their rabbis. They believe that the war going on in Gaza right now is the war that will lead into this first Gog-Magog war. 
And then we could read from Revelation chapter 16 at the end of the tribulation when all the nations are again gathered at Armageddon and they're destroyed there. We could also read from Revelation chapter 20 and we could talk about the second Gog Magog war when the Bible said that Satan gathered them there at the end of the thousand years before the white throne judgment. And, and we could go on through many conflicts in Israel's history. And yet the same cause for all of them, the same common thread keeps coming into focus over and over again. And the common focus, the common reason is because of the Jews and Jerusalem. The angel told Daniel, the angel Gabriel, he said in Daniel 9, 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city. That's Jerusalem. It's not America. We are not the promised land. We live like we think we're the promised land. But it's not the promised land. And New York and Los Angeles, uh, they are not God's favorite cities. The people he was speaking about that would endure the tribulation period are thy people, the Jews, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is called the city of God, the eternal city, the city of David, Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. God's name was written there. Abraham's faith was tried there. David's kingdom was established there. Solomon's temple was built there. Herod's temple was also built there. Jesus ministered there. He prophesied there. He died there. He rose from the grave there. He ascended from there. And he poured out his spirit upon his church there. There's no other city like it, no other city in the world like it. In fact, the Jews say that Adam was created there and God's final judgment will end there. According to King Hussein of Jordan, he said the city of Jerusalem in the Temple Mount area is the cause for all world terrorism. The Arab charter makes it clear that until the Jews are driven into the sea, or until they are exterminated in Jerusalem, is back in the hands of the Arabs, there will be no peace. I've said it before that Jerusalem is, and always has been, the most contentious, disputed spot on the face of the earth. The name Jerusalem means peace, and yet it's been fought over more than any other piece of real estate on the face of the earth. Mediators and presidents and ambassadors and world-renowned deal makers from all over the world have been coming to Israel for decades. So they came with Arabs and Jews in an attempt to find an agreement to work out a settlement uh, to even divide the city if they could do that in hopes that not only the Middle East but also the whole world could finally live at peace. But all attempts have failed and they will continue to fail because there will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes to this earth in all of his glory to take up his rightful position in the city of God. Ladies and gentlemen, it is and always has been a spiritual warfare. And this battle that we're fighting today all around us, it is a battle between good and evil. Amen. I want to give you some confidence today. It has never been about politics or financial matters or social ideas or, so, or cultural trends or race or freedom or socialism. It has always been an eternal battle of between good and evil. And we're now seeing that battle finally come full circle as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is about to take his rightful position on the throne in Jerusalem. 
Everything in our world that's going on right now, all the chaos, all the confusion, I want to tell you, it will all make better sense to you if you view it through that lens. It's not about politics. It's not about Democrats or Republicans. It's not about the economy. It's not about wars going on around the world or whatever they call that war, whatever the reason is. It is all about a war between good and evil. Somebody wants to sit in Jerusalem. Someone wants to be the king of the whole earth. But that king of the whole earth is about to reveal himself. He's about to come and set a foot on this earth and split the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and he's going to sit in, in, the, the, in the temple that's going to be built there because he is the king of glory. <laughs> Newsweek had a headline just a couple of days ago that caught my attention. The title of this, this headline was Holy War, Red Cows, Gaza, and the End of the World. I set my coffee down. <laughs> it was speaking of Jerusalem. The article said, and I quote, this is where the world began and perhaps it's where it will end. The true epicenter of the war in the Holy Land is not the devastated Gaza Strip that's under Israeli assault. Uh, since Hamas' bloody raid last October that sparked the region's deadliest conflict in decades. But rather, it is a few dozen miles away in Jerusalem at the holiest and most fiercely contested hilltop on earth. The war has increased religious tensions and given new impetus to groups of Jews and their evangelical Christian allies who are set on rebuilding the ancient temple where millennium-old Islamic shrines now stand, a suggestion that arouses horror not only of Palestinians and Muslims worldwide, but of many Jews in Israel and around the globe, as well as the would-be Middle East peacemakers. Third temple advocates have been preparing for the day when the temple can be rebuilt completely with rabbinical certified red cows shipped from Texas for use in a sacrificial purification ritual. The architectural designs are all ready. Along the lines of the detailed biblical descriptions, robes have all been woven and utensils have been assembled to biblical specifications for ceremonies at the planned temple. Messianic Jewish supporters believe that the rebuilding of the temple, rather than being divisive, would fulfill biblical prophecy to bring an era of peace with the temple as the house of prayer for all nations. Christian backers, meanwhile, believe it would be an important important step toward the second coming of Jesus and an apocalyptic last battle with the Antichrist. Our holy warriors who are fighting in Gaza are actually fighting for the building of the temple, one Jewish prayer leader pronounced recently on a controversial visit to the believed site of the two previous Jewish temples in Jerusalem. Marina Skokel, an Israeli mother whose son was just killed for fighting Hamas in Gaza, claimed that the war we're waging is a war for the Temple Mount. In their war to destroy Israel and replace it with an Islamic state, Hamas leaders have also re have, have readily draw, they readily draw on this, the symbolism of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount known to Muslims as Al-Sharif, the holy or the noble sanctuary. A Hamas spokesman told Newsweek, this round of conflict is being waged by the resistance under the name of uh, Alaska Flood. It is not for the sake of Gaza or the West. Bank, but rather for the sake of Jerusalem and Alaska Mosque. The Third Temple Advocates Newsweek calls us fringe groups who have gained strength from the far right-wing government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, believe that the building of the Holy Temple, a house of prayer for all nations, according to Isaiah 56 and 7, is the only peace plan that can and will succeed. The Muslims certainly understand the historic and religious significance of the Temple Mount for the Jewish people and therefore focus all of their incitement on the Temple Mount. Yitzhak Reuven, director of the Temple Institute International Department, told Newsweek, in effect, 
He said the war in Gaza is very much a war over the Temple Mount. For Palestinians, the growing Jewish religious activity at the site already is a step toward catastrophe. These are the seeds of conflict and the seeds of the type of fire that could burn the entire Middle East. A Palestinian spokesman told Newsweek, this is the most dangerous plot of land to be playing with, end of quote. Every war, every conflict, every problem, every example of human suffering, every act of greed, every act of injustice, all the political corruption, everything in one way or another is tied to Jerusalem and the battle between good and evil. It is all because of the sin that was in the garden that there is a devil that wants to take over. He's got in his mind that he's going to win, but I'm telling you, you can lift up your heads and get excited in this last day because everything looks like it's falling apart to the world, but I'm telling you, it's all falling right into place. You didn't ordain it. The politicians didn't ordain it. God Almighty ordained it, and he's going to show his power. He's going to show his grandeur. He's going to show his role as ruler of the universe in the acts that are about to happen in our world. We don't come to the house of God to be discouraged. We come to celebrate, to shout, to rejoice. We're not going to apologize for running the aisles. We're not going to apologize for dancing in the aisles. We're not going to apologize for screaming glory. Hallelujah. We need to clap our hands and lift our voice with a voice of triumph. We are in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's not going to have to shake a rock awake to get praise. He ought to get it from the people that love him and know him the most. Tomorrow, our whole country is finally, after several months of great anticipation, going to witness the most anticipated eclipse in any of our lifetimes. And as most of you already know, this particular eclipse in connection with the ones in 2017 and 2023 seem to have many prophetic end time overtones that are connected to them. Many Christians and Jewish scholars feel very confident that solar eclipses are a warning to the Gentile nations of the world, while the lunar eclipses are a warning to Israel. And they have thousands of years of history that prove that. And then when you get into all the details of the last three eclipses in the last seven years in America, it's staggering to say the least. I know some people believe that the rapture will happen some people are preaching this. They'll probably tell their churches this today. They believe that the rapture will happen tomorrow during the eclipse. They believe some that a nuclear war will start tomorrow. Some believe that a massive earthquake will rock this country tomorrow and even split the country into three sections. Well, if it does, I'm not leaving, I'll tell you that. The earthquake and the tremors that happened in New Jersey and New York on Friday, it got a lot of people shook up. A lot of people were worried. I started getting text messages from people. Is it a sign? I don't know if it's a sign. My goodness. But some believe this is not the sign of Jonah that may indicate a 40-day warning period. Some believe this is the sign of Amos. And if it's the sign of Amos, then the warning was actually given already in 2017, seven years ago. And this eclipse will simply be a stamp. It's God telling the world that your time, America, your time for repenting is now up and judgment can now commence. It certainly could happen. It's not me that makes the, makes the choice. If it's God's will, it's going to happen. But he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to. Their guess is as good as mine. But I personally don't believe any of that's going to happen tomorrow. I don't think any of those are going to happen because you know as I know. I believe that there is going to be a rapture that's going to take place around the Feast of Trumpets in September. I think the scripture is clear about that season. But I do believe that if the eclipse of the last seven years really are a warning from God to America, if it really is meant to be understood as the sign of Jonah that will give this nation 40 days to repent, then I have no doubt that something very powerful is going to be set into motion tomorrow, that no spiritual force in heaven or in earth will be able to stop. You may not physically see it, but it's going to happen. Something's going to transpire in the spirit world. If tomorrow 
tomorrow sets into motion a 40 day space to repent that 40 day time period is going to end on the feast of Pentecost and as you already know the feast of Pentecost in the Old Testament began the harvest season and it ended four months later at the feast of trumpets Paul said we're listening for that last trumpet that's exactly why God scheduled nothing for the four months between Pentecost and the feast of tabernacles why because he didn't want you celebrating and playing around and traveling all over the country he wanted you to stay there so nothing would interfere with the harvest season he scheduled Passover unleavened bread the first fruits three festivals in the same week because the death burial and resurrection of Jesus would fulfill all of them in the same week and then 50 days later hallelujah he scheduled the Pentecost to begin the harvest season and then nothing else was scheduled until the feast of Pentecost no interruptions I already think that there's some people right now that reject the idea that God's going to send revival to America in these last days and I'm telling you they may be right but I'm not going to accept it as long as there's breath in my body don't send me a bunch of angry letters telling me how wrong I am let me live in this fantasy if I want to whether I'm right or wrong I can tell you I'm expecting something's going to happen I'm expecting a revival that's going to shake the foundations of this world I'm expecting a revival like we've never seen and we never let our minds begin to imagine what the Lord is about to do in this world So whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, don't, don't send me no angry letters trying to correct me. I want to live in this bliss of ignorance. I probably ought to say I'm, I'll tell you what I'm hoping will happen. I'm hoping that on Pentecost Sunday this year, May the 19th, 40 days after the eclipse tomorrow, that the Holy Ghost will begin to fall all over this country and around the world in the greatest outpouring in human history. I heard the Pope a few years ago said, what this world needs is another outpouring of Pentecost. I agree with the Pope on that one thing. We need an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this final hour. I'm hoping that tomorrow will set something into motion. I'm hoping that that 40 days later, the day of Pentecost, will set into motion the billion soul revival that's been prophesied by Brother Charles Robinette, as well as many other powerful men and women of God for the last 120 years. And according to reports all over the world, it's already happening over there. Thousands of people are getting the Holy Ghost in a single service from every imaginable denomination. Thousands are being instantly healed as waves of healing sweep over congregations. People came in wheelchairs and they walk home. They came blind and they leave seeing. People that had no hearing, they didn't need a deaf teacher because they were all healed. That's the revival I'm looking for. That's what I'm expecting is going to happen in this church and in this city. I'm hoping that, to, that the day of Pentecost sets into motion on Pentecost Sunday, the greatest supernatural wave of healing and miracles that history has ever seen, especially in America. I'm hoping that this last revival will finally close out the harvest season four months later at the Feast of Trumpets when the church of the living God begins to hear that last trumpet sound that's going to remove us from this world and begin the last seven years known as the great tribulation. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for revival. I'm looking for revival greater than Azusa Street. I'm looking for revival that'll cause us to have to have church every day, all day, where the Holy Ghost has fallen and people by the thousands are being baptized. Creative miracles are so frequent at the hands of the common people that no one is going to be shocked by it. I want to preach to people from the front porch. I want to preach to them in that side yard. I want to see the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost move just like it did at Azusa Street 24 hours a day, 7 days a week for 4 months of great harvest. I'm not just preaching fantasy to you. I'm telling you, I've got, I've got confidence it's about to happen and I want to be a part of it.
I want a revival that our buildings won't hold. I want a revival where we don't need a program and we don't have to come to practice anything. Hallelujah. I don't care if the lights go out. I still want revival. I don't care if we got no water. We got to bring our own water. I want revival. I don't care if you can't drive anymore. If you got to walk up here, I want us to get as close as we can, and we're going to have revival. If you can't make it up the hill, we'll give you a little bit of time. Somebody will pull you up in a wagon. But we want to make sure that we are in the presence of God for whatever is coming upon this world. Some people are looking for tomorrow to be the end of the world. No, that's conspiracy stuff. I'm not looking for that. What I'm looking for is revival. I'm looking for a space that God gives that will spark revival. I want people to start repenting. I want people to stop debating about doctrine and start falling in love with the truth. And since over 90% 97% of all Christian denominations believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I feel like I'm in good company. Could we be wrong? Of course. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. But I don't think we are. I've been studying this subject for 40, over 40 years now. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't study it to validate my views. I study it because I want to be sure I'm right. I've got to be right. I've got a family that I love. I need to know how to protect them, how to prepare them. If we're going to be here during a tribulation, the greatest time of human suffering in the history of the world, I need to have some direction for my family. And if we're here for that dreadful time, we're all going to have to make some very difficult, unimaginable decisions for ourselves and for our families, our children. And most of us are going to die very early. In fact, we're going to have to choose to die if we're going to reject the Antichrist system. Revelation chapter 9 describes demonic creatures like locusts are going to be released from the bottomless pit. They're going to torment men on the earth for five months, causing them to beg for death, but death will flee from them. The seals are going to be open. The vials and the bowls are going to be poured out. Plagues of death and poison waters and scorching heat will all be happening in this rapid succession. Can, it's going to cause unimaginable pain, suffering, and misery. If you want to sit here, if you're looking forward to that, or you say you believe we go through that, I want to know how are you preparing for that. If I thought I went through it, I couldn't sleep at night. I'd be tormented about what was coming. I'd get up every day and pray that I'd die before the tribulation starts. Uh, God, take me out in a heart attack because I don't want to be here for any of that. Uh, but you better hope that the 97% of us are right uh, because you're not going to want to be here during the last seven years uh, when that tribulation begins. Uh, and I say that because I know some preachers uh, and prophecy teachers are believing that the great tribulation will start this coming September or early October. And uh, Lord God, I hope they're wrong. I'm not looking for the tribulation to start then with us in it. I'm looking for it to start, but we're gone. I'm looking for us to be gone. I want to see a, a great revival before we're gone. I want to get our families in here. I want to get our neighbors and our loved ones and our co-workers, everybody we meet, I want them to come here. Get ready so they don't have to stay here for that event. I have no desire to sit around the same old rut trying to encourage a bunch of seasoned saints not to panic. Come on, folks, let's all just hunker down and try our best to hold the fort until Jesus comes. No, sir, I want revival, red-hot revival. I want the greatest revival we've ever had. I want us to all be complaining here in just a few weeks. I want us to be complaining we're not getting any rest. We're up all the time. We're giving Bible studies to everybody. We're seeing the Lord do miraculous things. And some of you got to be commissioned to baptize other people in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to see it in a rotation where we just keep trading places. I'm tired. you got to do it now. I'm tired. You got to put someone else up. That's what I want to see. Adam Berkowitz with Rabbi Josh Warner had an interview about the red heifer a couple of days ago. 
I'm going to read this interview, parts of it. It's, it's long. I'm not going to read all of it, but I want to read a portion of it. Rabbi Warner, he quoted from a Jewish writing that speaks of the importance of keeping things under wraps because of the satanic forces out there that are always trying to stop the process of purity and redemption. And the quieter we keep it, he said, the easier it will be because the more that's out there, it gives opportunity for these forces, including Hamas and Hezbollah. So we shouldn't be too vocal about what we're doing. He's talking about not telling people what's happening with the red heifer. He said, needless to say, there's a lot going on. He said, more than we have seen in generations, but this will not be a simple ride. Rabbi Warner said to Adam, he said, you often talk about the disputes among Christian denominations as to what it means to bring the red heifer and to have the third temple. But I would argue that even within the Orthodox Jewry, this is going to be a huge, huge debate. And there are a lot of questions that have not been dealt with in millennia that we're going to be forced to deal with now. Most people would just assume that the red heifer is just a Jewish thing and no one else cares about it until Hamas claimed that it was the reason that they started the war. Even Hezbollah announced at the day of the conference that was held in Shiloh with 120 rabbis that gathered to discuss the red heifer ceremony, they treated it as if it was an international incident that justified raining rockets down on Israel. And then the media went crazy demanding to know why would the Jews do such a thing to incite war? Josh said, he said, the whole messianic process is something done in secrecy. And not only in secrecy, but it's also done in very unusual ways in order to confuse these forces that are trying to stop it. He said, so the process is only going to be revealed after it has happened. Even so, he said, there are hints about what is about to occur. And I think once it does, it will be a tidal wave. It will be a tsunami within the Jewish community and with the whole world. Adam said, we have more movement on this in the last two years on the temple service and on the red heifer on the, the Messiah than we've had in the last 2,000 years. He said, it's all of a sudden barreling down like a freight train. He said, I mean, in, in just a space of three hours today, we heard the breaking news that the Messiah really is coming. And then Rabbi Warner interrupted him. And he said, that's because we are running out of time. Adam then took a few more veiled shots at Christians again because Christians believe that the temple is the Antichrist temple. Rabbi Warner then, just out of the blue, he said, Russian troops are now on the, Assyri the Israel and Syrian border. And Iran just gave us a 48-hour ultimatum that we were going to be attacked by Iran. He said, but we're not worried because this will not be the first time we were attacked by Persia. And God saved us before, so we're not too worried. He then said, "This man, this sent chills up my spine. He said, if you remember the attack on the Iranian embassy in Beirut, that was last week, that killed 11 generals. He said, do you realize that during the same week, we were actually reading the passage of scripture in the regular rotation about Haman and his 10 sons being killed. He said the top general who was in charge of the attacks on Israel in Iran was killed in that bombing with 10 of his cohorts. You can't make that up. God orchestrated all that so it would happen on that day. I'm telling you, when I see small things like that, it reminds me we are not in control of anything. God is doing everything. Even things you think don't matter. Even things you think are random. They are not random with God. He's got the whole world in his hand. Every moment, every hour, every week, every month, every year, every millennium, he's in charge of all of it. They also said that everything changed when coronavirus hit. Well, that's exactly how. I mentioned that when it happened. That's exactly how the red heifers got to Israel. 
No livestock can be shipped until it's got a tag in its ear. And when these, when these red heifers were born, it was during COVID, and there should have been, the man should have come out as they do from the agriculture department, and they should have put a tag in its ear that day and recorded all of its information. But they didn't. Because of the coronavirus, they didn't. And so these red heifers were shipped to Israel, not as livestock, but as pets. God did that. God, God made sure that there were five red heifers that were pure, that were ready to be shipped. And God then made everything. He took out the, the, the paperwork. He took out all the red tape, all the obstacles. He made them stepping stones. And all of these people now that, that I used to think were at, but a little bit out of their minds, wanting to take a horse or something on an airplane for comfort, at least they managed to make something good out of it because they shipped them over there as pets. God knows exactly what he's doing and I believe that he's got everything in control today. I don't know what somebody said well he don't know what's going on in my life I promise you he knows every step you took to get here he knows every step you're going to take today tomorrow and the week before and the year after he knows exactly where you are and exactly where you're going and if you'll follow him and trust him he said the steps of a good man they are ordered of the Lord Rabbi Warner said the Jews that are still in exile, especially in America, he said they used to push hard against me whenever I would talk to them about making Aliyah or making the return to Israel. But since the war on October the 7th and the massive increase in anti-Semitism, they're not pushing back anymore because American Jews now realize that the American empire is coming to an end. And they need to start thinking about their own futures. Even secular Jews, he said, now realize that anti-Semitism is not just focused on religious Jews. I was telling somebody the other day that anti, the anti-religious didn't save any of the Jews of Europe during Hitler's uh, uh, desire to exterminate all of them. But Rabbi Warner is the very rabbi that said during the Aliyah conference, there will be no place on earth safe for Jews outside of Israel. When God said he would bring them home. He's the one that let the anti-Semitism rise. He's the one that, that caused that hate to begin to boil over in colleges and in communities and cities, even in America. He's the one that allowed America's government to stand against Israel. God's doing all of it because he's bringing them home. If he brings them home, he's taking us home. I'm looking forward to what he's going to do for the church, but I got to keep my eye on what he's doing to the Jews. The red heifers came off the plane two and a half years ago, he said. And it got some attention on the internet for a month or two, and most people didn't know anything about it. In fact, Adam said, none of the Jews in America knew anything about it, but the Christians certainly did. He said, but now it's back in the media spotlight because Hamas, a Hamas spokesman said the war started because of the red heifers. Rabbi Warner said, our enemies have a very clear vision of their goal, but unfortunately, the Israelis do not. So now the most coveted patch that they wear on their shoulder for the Israeli soldiers, what they want to wear in their fight in Gaza is a patch of the Jewish temple. Because we want to be reminded of what we're fighting for. We are fighting for the temple mount. It's always been about Jerusalem. It's always been about the Temple Mount. It's always been about worshiping God. Amen. Even though they've been praying for the Temple three times a day for 2,000 years, he said most news, media most, most news media attention on the red heifers is negative and even combative. And although Adam chastised Christians, Christians even called us liars for saying that the Jews planned to offer the red heifer on Passover, he said that that the representatives from the Temple Institute said, no, that's not going to happen. But then he said, however, he said, I just heard three hours ago that a kosher Cohen has been found who's perfectly qualified to do the sacrifice and is now in training. So now I guess I could be wrong. And now it may happen very soon. Rabbi Warner, he said, well, it could happen because we got to leave that up to God. But he said, thousands of years ago, Jewish commentators said 
this particular last red heifer. It will have a lot of opposition, and specifically from the nations of the world. They will be asking the question, why are you performing this? So we were expecting this opposition all along. In addition, Rabbi Warner said, I don't think you realize the full extent of what this means. Because even if all the nations were on board with this, and the United Nations had a unanimous declaration that we should go ahead and bring the red heifer, he said, the opposition that's going to happen within the Jewish community is going to be much, much greater than anything we're now seeing coming from outside the Jewish community. He said, there are even elements within the left-wing Israeli government that would love to sabotage this event because they think we would all be better off if this red heifer sacrifice never happened. He said, the greatest opposition will come from Jewish rabbis who study the scripture all day and who are the most right-wing, and yet they will not welcome any change. He said, I think a revival of all the commandments that have been forgotten and neglected over our years, through our years of exile. And now, he said, I think now they're coming back, and this is going to be hugely transformative to the Jewish people. To the Orthodox Jews that have spent their whole lives thinking they're performing the entire Torah, he said, they're going to wake up one morning and say, wait. There's a whole lot more that we haven't done. The interview then ended with Adam admitting that he may be wrong now that a young man has been chosen to do the sacrifice and the red heifer may be offered on Passover after all. But then Rabbi Warner actually corrected him by admitting the red heifer will not be offered on Passover. He said it would have to be offered at least a week before Passover. Because the process of purification has to be performed the week before Passover for it to be effective, end of quote. They don't even realize they're going to fulfill the role that Jesus played. He crucified his will on Lamb Selection Day. He was the red heifer. He was the one that finished the blood work. And they don't even realize what they're doing, but they're going to fulfill that prophecy. They're going to fulfill that type and shadow. Our, our guide in Israel said, he told us he was a Jewish man. He said, if you ask two Jews one question, you'll get three answers because one of them will not agree with himself. That's been my experience since the red heifers were delivered a year and a half ago. Adam Berkowitz called Christians ignorant liars who were talking about the red heifer being sacrificed on Passover or even on Good Friday before Easter because we didn't speak, we don't speak Hebrew and we don't know people from the Temple Institute. However, all of us dumb Christians, I guess, apparently were listening to all the same Jewish representatives of a year and a half ago who were said to be working with the Temple Institute. In fact, Adam acted like the kosher Cohen boy was just discovered who is actually qualified to offer the red heifer sacrifice. So maybe, he said, maybe I was wrong. Maybe they are going to do it sooner. But the man that brought the actual, bought the actual property on the Mount of Olives where the sacrifices are going to take place. He said a year and a half ago that they already have five young men from the seed of Aaron who are already qualified and already trained then to perform the sacrifice. I told my wife, I said, there is no way. They've been waiting for 2,000 years for a red heifer to show up. And then when it does, they wait a couple of weeks before it's scheduled after having it for a year and a half. They wait a couple of weeks before it's scheduled to be sacrificed to try to find somebody now that can, they can train at the last minute to do it. We may not be Jewish, but we're not stupid. I understand completely why they need to maintain as much caution and secrecy as possible. But I know, I know why they're not going to live stream it. But I can assure you when they're finished, when it's been sacrificed, and the ashes are gathered together and safely hidden in a clean place, we're going to know something in the spirit world has changed. You might not know what it is, but you're going to know something changed. The Jews believe that the times of the Gentiles, it's going to end with that offering. Think about that. 
that and if the Christians were right. One rabbi said, and Jesus really was the Messiah and the Jews missed him, then the church age is going to end with that sacrifice. The rapture will catch the church out as God returns to the Jews, his chosen people. If those red heifers are not offered this year before Passover, they're going to be too old. They won't be able to do it next year and they will no longer qualify. I can't imagine that they would risk letting the clock run out after waiting 2,000 years. I'm telling you, the signs are telling us you are even at the door. And if we're going to do something for God, we can't let the time run out. We can't let the clock run out. We can't keep messing around. We got to get right with God. If you want to repent, you need to do it today. If you want to draw close to him, you need to start that journey today. If you feel like you need to forgive somebody, you need to get rid of that today. I'm hurrying here. Oh, my goodness. Well, I don't know what time I got up, so maybe I got a few more minutes. Matthew 24 and 1. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. The disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. Jesus dropped a bombshell on them when he said in verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. They were so, so shocked they didn't say anything until they crossed that 20-minute walk from the, from the temple over to the Garden of Gethsemane, or the Mount of Olives. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? That's one question. Number two, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? coming? That's the second question. And number three, and the end of the world. The rabbi himself said that the Jews didn't know anything about the red heifers, but the church or the Christians certainly did. You know why? Because we're watching. We're looking for it. We're studying about it. We're, it's important to us. Why? Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up. Lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawing nigh. We ought to get excited about going home. When I was getting married, I, I, I'm may have had some butterflies on that day as we were approaching that day. If she knows who I am, she might end up really changing her mind. Maybe she'll get a better offer and she'll change her mind. Who knows? But that day uh, when, when we finally, I get to look down the aisle and see her coming, it was a glorious day. I'm telling you, I'm not sitting around crying, hoping the Lord delays his coming, saying I wish he'd wait another year. I wish he'd wait another five years. No! I want to be with the bridegroom groom. I want to be caught away to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm ready for that celebration. Of course, Jesus mentioned many things. I can't read them. I don't, I don't have time for them to watch for. Things that would make no sense to the rest of the world, but it would, present that it would be presented as prophetic beacons of hope to a weary church in the last days. And then he specifically mentioned the restoration of the rebirth of Israel when he said in verse 32, and I learned a parable of the fig tree, when its branches yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, even you shall see all these things, know that it is near and even at the doors. Uh, Mark said it like this, Mark 13, 29. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. That's the generation that sees the rebirth of Israel. You're all going also going to see the rapture of the church and the great tribulation period. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. You can tell me that I've lost my mind, but I'm telling you, the book said he's coming back. The book said he's coming back. He's coming to get a bride, a bride that's watching and waiting for that return. Many scholars have disagreements about the details of end time prophecy. But one thing, one thing they all agree on is the, the fact that Israel is God's time clock. The church needs to watch Israel because what goes on in Israel is going to go on in the church. I want you to notice something else here. We're familiar with Israel being carried away captive into a singular foreign country where world powers would judge them. And God delivered them. He delivered them from individual countries, Babylon, 
Persia, the Greeks, the Roman, they all ruled over the Jews. But in the last day, after the temple was destroyed and the Jews were scattered throughout the whole world, not to one country, but throughout the whole world. And it's important because God didn't just herd them there. He scattered them. And then it was going to take a miracle to bring them back. And he's doing it right now. A miracle is what brought them back in 1948. A miracle is what let them win a war outnumbered 40 to 1 in 1967 and the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And I'm telling you, he is coming back for a people that's made themselves ready. I don't know who they are, but he knows who they are. He knows who his people are, and he knows who his church is. But he promised to gather them at the end of the church age. Psalms 122 and 1. I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It was not talking about the church. It was not talking about the temple because they were not built yet. The house of the Lord was one of some 40 names given to the city of Jerusalem. He wasn't talking about the temple. It wasn't built yet. He told us what he was talking about. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He said, for our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. He's talking about Jerusalem, the city of God. Jerusalem, he said, is builded as a city that is compact together. Verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. There was the walls around Jerusalem, but then there was walls around the individual palace of David. Peace be within thy walls, your city, and within thy palaces, my house, my abode. Zechariah 2 and 1, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Jerusalem is going to be inhabited as towns without walls? For the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, I will be a wall of fire around about her. I will be the glory in the midst of her. Verse 12, and the Lord shall inherit Judah his portion in the holy land and shall choose Jerusalem again. We know that before the year 1860, when you spoke of the city of Jerusalem, you were talking about what was in the confines of the walls of the old city. But the book of Zechariah said that Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. In the year 1860, this prophecy was fulfilled when for the first time in their history, the Jews began to build outside of the walls the safety of the walls of that city, which was the first sign of Jewish expansion and restoration, it also was a sign of the beginning of the end for the church age. Joel 2 and 23 said, Be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. The land's going to be restored, he said, in the same breath. He also said in verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit. When you put all of these prophecies together, there's no doubt this is the first generation fully capable of being the last. The first one fully capable of being the last. Jesus removed all doubt that these are coincidental things. He gave dozens of things that would happen in the same generation. Some things were prophesied thousands of years ago. Some of the very, the very nations that were described coming against Israel didn't even exist when the prophets spoke of them. When the red 
the, the towers fell. 9-11. I'm, I'm closing. You can stand with me. If you don't stand, I won't close. I've got too much here. <laughs> when the towers fell, that began... That began the seeds, it planted the seeds for World War III or Armageddon. Everything has been on a fast track since 9-11. But it, it jumped into another gear during COVID. When COVID hit, everything, everything changed. Not just in the world, in the spirit world. We didn't have to be in the building. We didn't have to come together in church to feel it. It happened. I want to encourage you that all the things that are going on in this world, I don't even bother listening to political ads anymore. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I don't care who gets elected. I don't care about any of that. Hope we're not here for that. But I can tell you that God, God has used every political person. When they got into office, how in the world could... How in the world could a president that was in a basement for nine months has dementia? He can't put sentences together. How in the world could he get 81 million votes? But you're not allowed to question it. Just accept it. It had to be God. Because under that administration, it has weakened our nation. I just saw... I think it was last night, the article said that Britain has turned its back on Israel. Another article said that America has threatened Israel, and things will never be the same between them. The nations of the world are doing exactly what the Bible said, and it took this war in Gaza to set it into motion. It's not an accident. Nothing is happening by accident. America is not going to be the superpower in the last days. I've been preaching that for 25, 30 years. A revived Roman Empire, Europe led by an antichrist, will be the power. America will not save Israel. God will. God will. The Bible tells us that Jerusalem would become a cup of poison to all that trouble themselves with it. Zechariah 12 and 2, Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling poison, and all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people that burden themselves with it, shall be cut off in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. The whole world has changed, and it's moving very rapidly. But our hope our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the rapture. All that's going on in the world, it's, it's seeds concerning the battle for Jerusalem. Have you been baptized in his name? Amen. What if, what if we're wrong? What if the Lord comes this week? What if this is the last opportunity with warm water for you to get a chance to be baptized? when it can count, when it matters. Someday there'll be no opportunity. You'll wake up one day and you'll get an emergency alert on your phone, your TV, your car radio, telling you we don't know what happened, but millions of people have disappeared. Stay tuned for more information. It'll be too late. No matter how fast you can get to the church, it's too late. Now you're going to endure whatever is coming on this world. If you have never repented of your sins, never been baptized in his name, never been filled with his spirit, would you take a chance today or take an opportunity today to come to this altar? Rabbi Warner said concerning the red heifer, he said, we're running out of time. We have to get it sacrificed. You as the church, you're running out of time. If you've got an ought against your brother, you need to get it fixed today. You're running out of time. The battle is already raging. Don't be a casualty. Would you come? Would you join us in this altar?
We find a place to pray today.